Uh, welcome everybody to the first Barraza of the 21-22 academic year. Um, we are going to start momentarily, and for those of you that are new uh, to this format and joining us perhaps for the first time from UF or from elsewhere, um, nationally or internationally, uh, this is set up in the webinar format, so we're not going to be using the chat function. So at the end of uh, Professor and Joya's talk, we should have somewhere between 40 to 45 minutes of time left for comments and discussion. Um, I'll ask you to use the raise hand function uh, in Zoom. Uh, I'll, then, I'll then call on you, and when I do that, I will... Uh, it, promote you to panelists, as they say in the webinar system here, which means you will have the ability to turn on your video uh, and if you wish to do so uh, it, it, when commenting or questioning um, in the group. Um, that also means you will, if you turn on your video, this is going to be recorded and at some point edited and uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you do turn on your video, you are giving consent um, for your image to be recorded. Uh, before we get started, I just want to bring your attention to a couple events upcoming next week. On Wednesday, we have a book launch event uh, for Professor Emeritus René Le Marchand. Uh, he has a new book on remembering genocide uh, in Central Africa. And there'll be a panel on that on Wednesday morning. Thursday morning, we have uh, the first uh, Africa-China working group session, uh, and there'll be dealing with uh, pandemic's impact on China-Africa relations. And then Friday afternoon, at the same time as Barraza, we will have, I believe it's our 29th annual distinguished lecture in African archaeology. So look for all of that, um, either in our news bulletin early in the week and individual email announcements. Uh, and with that being said, I'm going to ask Professor Apollo Amoko to introduce today's speaker. So Apollo, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, good Todd. Good afternoon, everybody. It's kind of eerie to address an audience I can't see, but I have great faith that you are all here. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Wendy and Jaya for the first, for the inaugural Barraza of this uh, academic year. Um, before that, I would like just to say a word of personal thanks to the center, which has been extremely supportive of the intellectual projects have been engaged in, in particular last year. I hope some of you were at the Africa COVID time conference that we organized with the extraordinary generosity of the center. And uh, one day I was actually supposed to be a panelist at that conference, but the gods of the internet conspired to sabotage those plans. And then I had the idea to invite her for Baraza and I am very grateful that Todd put it together in very quick time. I did not expect that she would be the first one off the cuff. So Todd, very grateful. Uh, I've known one dear a very long time, even though the relationship has mostly been from a distance. I think we met first uh, at the turn of the century when one dear was a fresh eyed graduate student at Penn State. Uh, and we were at the center of, at an African Literature Association conference, I believe in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, and uh, unlike me who sold out and remained in what's known as the great Satan in the Republic of Iran, <laughs> Wendy and Joya was committed and principled enough and she went back to Kenya upon obtaining a PhD from Penn State. Uh, in comparative literature and French. Uh, and she has been teaching from, she has been teaching at Daystar University, which is a leading private university in Nairobi. I believe kind of autonomous, but sponsored by the Catholic church. She may correct me if I've mistaken that detail. Uh, and as you can see from your, from the bio that was sent out, she has published a number of interesting things having to do with education policy and uh, literature in such journals as Ufahamu and comparative literature studies. But I have paid a keen attention to her as a very vocal, uh, forthright and insightful public intellectual in the Kenyan space who has written for popular publications as well as appeared in the media, again, to talk about education policy, uh, politics, questions of race and 
uh, it is on that basis that I thought she would be a invaluable intellectual contribution. And with those few remarks, I urge you to join me in silently welcoming her. Today, she'll be talking to us. Uh, her title today is, is Ifikie Mastude, the political vernacular of education in Kenya. Welcome, Wandia. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Moko. Uh, it's nice to see you again, um, you know, off and on after many years. Uh, thank you, Todd, also for organizing this event and for your patience in uh, getting me to, to concentrate and send you the required information. I also want to thank the University of Florida and the Department of African Studies for inviting me. I'm very honored to be able to share the thoughts I have today with you. And I, I think there might be some Kenyans who have stayed up at night, so I also want to thank them for hanging around. Um, the title of my paper comes from a Twitter hashtag that was started in July 2018 by the handle of the Directorate of Criminal Investigations, which is the Kenya equivalent of the FBI. And Ifikie Mastude is a Sheng rendition of the term, uh, pass, on, pass it on to students. And it was in reference to a message that the DCI or the police wanted to pass on to high school students. So, um, uh, just give me a second so that I can share my my presentation so that you can see. Um, sorry for the delay. So um, this this was the the this was the the Twitter uh, message that was sent, and it was coming after there had been a series of fires. Usually June and July we have uh, a, a series of fires in the high schools, um, and by the middle of July 2018, the media had reported that 22 schools had been affected by school fires. Uh, June and July are typically months when fires increase, largely due to the high stakes mock examinations which are taking place and, and which the teenagers are supposed to sit. And it also happens to be the coldest months of the year. And of course, the, and the students are living in fairly harsh conditions in the boarding schools. Um, some of the conditions include uh, having to wake up before dawn to fetch water to bathe. Uh, they don't usually have access to adequate food and nutrition, and they are growing teenagers. And there's also a lot of brutality, both from older students and from teachers. And one of the things I've done on Twitter is to have a hashtag tyranny of 3PC, which archives reports of school violence in Kenya. So as one can see from this Twitter image, uh, the tweet tagged uh, other security, uh, government security agencies, but it also uh, um, tagged the Nation Africa, which is Kenya's leading media house. And the pictures that you can see in the tweet contain screenshots of, and headline, of headlines about riots in schools and universities with a warning as you can see, that the police would keep, keep a permanent record of the students. Um, so in the thread, you had also uh, a threat that uh, student, if students were caught uh, after riots, they would, be, they would not be allowed to get a certificate of good conduct, which has increasingly become a requirement for employment in Kenya. And these are the crimes that were attributed to the students. Okay, you can see here they were saying they will not get employment because of what they did. And then these are the crimes that they um, listed. You can see armed and, and peaceable demos, and you can see these are just children. 
uh, arson, drug, cyberbullying, uh, drunkenness, and any reported crime. You can see the only people who have arms are the police in these photos. Um, so these tweets were being targeted at, at minors, which is unconstitutional and illegal. Uh, but the following day, the same handle uh, released a press statement uh, from the Minister of Education, who at the time was Amina Mohammed, attributing the school unrest to disappointment of students who would be unable to cheat in the examinations due to the efficient administration of the Kenya government. Um, essentially, the high school students were being criminalized, both as exam cheats uh, and as hooligans who riot whenever they, they get what they don't get what they want. That the police that a police handle was disseminating a statement from the Ministry of Education demonstrates the extent to which the state uh, views our youth as criminals who must be responded to with force. On Twitter, which is a vocal social platform for Kenyans, hashtags like these about police or gun violence are typically followed by a wave of tweets which justify the threats and violence which demonize the children. Uh, so for example, usually people, general, the general public uh, tweets back and says that this is an unfair characterization of students. As you can see here, there's a tweet here uh, asking, you know, why are you focusing on students as if they are the, the and while the real criminals are not being prosecuted. Um, and then but then you also see a lot of tweets like these that support uh, the, the state violence. Like this one says that the scrapping of Viboko, which is the whip, uh, is, is uh, from our kids has cost us a lot of, I guess, in discipline. And then they say um, the, that we must spare the road and spoil the child. Um, so this is what typically happens whenever there's uh, uh, news about violence from the police or threats of violence. Uh, for example, even when there's uh, an extra judicial killing, especially in the slums, we also see these kinds of tweets. Anybody who decries the police violence receives several replies justifying the police action, calling the young men dangerous and implying that they deserved to die for breaking the law. And one also receives accusations that they are insensitive to the plight of poor communities who are harassed by these gangsters. And normally when such hashtags gain traction, they are flooded with replies of short clips of young video clips of young people engaged in different kinds of sexual action with insults directed especially at the girls. So I'm not going to post them because they are pretty violent, uh, but I guess anyone can check. Um, I'm mentioning this because this hashtag, ifikie, which means let it reach or pass it on to, uh, is similar to a previous one, which was called ifikie wazazi, let, it, let, let the parents get the message. And in this hashtag, ifikie wazazi, there were more lurid photos posted with warnings to parents to raise their children properly. So when the police picked up the Ifikie hashtag, they were using a version of that, the previous hashtag, which was for uh, parents. And a fellow academic, Caroline Mose, would later remark that the Ifikie Wazazi hashtag seemed aimed at uh, shaming and embarrassing the youth as too immoral and so they did not merit a social voice and it was also aimed at destroying the uh, possibility of authentic emotions among the youth the shaming also of parents also falls in line with the current evangelically rooted idea of privatizing education and other social services by making the parents wholly responsible for the children's opportunities so the interest of my paper today is the discursive violence that uh, polices and justifies violence against children and especially those who attend school. I will argue that the extrajudicial killings affecting mainly poor youth in the slums or rural areas who do not have access to a decent education 
is paralleled by violence in the school system. The threats of the police to destroy the futures of the youth are just one side of the violence. The other side of the violence, which is the focus of my paper, is the way in which the professional class, especially the journalists, academics, and government civil servants, use strate uh, rhetorical strategies to cover up the violence that the children suffer in boarding schools at the hands of teachers and fellow students. I had already written a, a, a piece in The Elephant uh, entitled Our Words Must Count, in which I wondered at the manner in which these horrific testimonies of rape and violence, which uh, children suffer in school, did not reach capture the news media or national attention. The testimonies online were triggered by a tweet by Silas Miami, who had asked for stories about um, high school only to receive a deluge of stories about violence that people had suffered as students. And these stories did not make the headlines. So um, for me, that was very striking because at around the same time that these stories were trending, uh, the newspaper reported another trend of stories uh, from Twitter where Kenyans were complaining about the ugliness of the Olympic, uh, the Kenya Olympic team's uniforms. So that, that trend reached the media headlines, but not the trend which had the stories of, of um, the testimonies of students who had suffered violence in high school. So I want to build up my observations by discussing a panel interview that took place four years ago on September 6, 2017. Larry Madowo, who was then at NTV and is now at Citizen, hosted a discussion of the Kenyan epidemic of school fires. This discussion was quite rare because it included a young Kenyan, Tracy Indasi, an 18-year-old high school uh, graduate who boldly and articulately voiced the frustration of regular Kenyan high school students. And this was a major feat because her fellow panelists uh, were experts in education, psychology, and disaster management. So I'll share the link later, but for now, I want to show you the beginning of the conversation. I've, I've edited a few clips and then uh, I'll use the panel discussion and responses from social media to argue that Kenya has a discursive infrastructure of, of, uh, that makes questioning the school system and by extension the colonial state unthinkable. I will then make some comments on the idea of, a poli of the political vernacular, which was developed by Keguro Masharia, and which is used to continually protect the colonial education system by creating a false division between colonial education and school violence. So just before I play it, I'll just put the context. Um, it took place three days after a fire had burned down in Moi, Nairobi Girls, one of the more prestigious uh, girls secondary schools in the country and had claimed the lives of nine students. Accounts about what happened differ, but it was said that the fire was started by a student who kept making pleas to her parents to be withdrawn from the school, and she hoped that the fire would cause a disruption. Unfortunately, the overcrowding of the school and the locked exits made the tragedy inevitable, and sadly, this tragedy joined a long list of other similar tragedies. So I'm just going to share uh, just a clip of of the of the conversation that took place, and and I what I'd like you to look at is just the the composition of the panel and and how uh, the young lady speaks uh, uh, her mind. It's, it's very interesting.
Perhaps it could have been avoided. We're talking about the Moe Nairobi Girls School Fire, which claimed the lives of nine students. A lot of people agree that tragedy could have been avoided. It is just the latest in the... The last few years, I've seen so many of these tragedies. Why is it that there are no lessons that have been learned from that? Why is it that the fire engine arrived an hour late? And what can we take from that to move forward? Let me bring out my guest right now. Dr. Andrew Riechi is a senior lecturer at the University of Nairobi School of Edu Education. He's also involved in the education sector. We'll talk about that in a moment. Tracy Ndassi is with us, the youngest guest ever, I believe, on Sidebar. She is a student. She just completed high school last year. Uh, we'll talk about where in a moment. Also joining me today is Pius Masai. He is the deputy director of the National Disaster Management Unit, and he's been talking to schools about what they need to do to avoid strategies like that in the future. And last but not least, also joining me is uh, Dr. Charity Waidema, who is a clinical psychologist, a lecturer at the African Union, Nazarene University. Thank you all so much for coming in here. Completed high school. Where were you? In, uh, where did you go to high school? Friend School, Kevay Girls. That's in Vehiga County? Yes. There was a lot of people are starting now to come to terms with what the formation of this dome at Moe Nairobi Girls School was. It, it appears to have been very crowded, mm -hmm. there were grills, and it was very difficult to get out. What was the, the situation like in your school? Could something like this have happened in any other school in the country? I'm sorry to say it could have. Yes. Why is that? What was your experience in high school? What was your high school like? Easy. Life in high school was merely a prison. To all students, we want to sit and behave like everything is okay, everything is fine, but you know it's not fine. Life in high school, it's extremely controlled. Why do you call it a prison? Because you're in the same place. You know, my mom used to tell me that long time ago, school was the place to go because in school you could have three meals a day, take bread for breakfast, and it was a loop for escaping money luck, you know. But right now... School, it's the home which is being escaped. School, it is manual work throughout. School, there is the corporal punishment, which you name discipline, of which, in my opinion, the liability of disciplining the child, I think it should shift from the school to the parents because they believe that the roots of discipline have their origins at home. And the other prison-like feeling is replicated in the domes, right? Where you hold these grills, there's one way to exit. It is, you, they close it so that the you can... The rationale of this student is that when we burn the dormitories, we get to go home. Dr. Waidema, this is stuff, you've, you've done counseling for high school students. Yes. They consider it a prison. Yes. Why do. is that? Because no human being want to be contained in one place. Yet, all these measures are taken with the, the interest of the student in mind. But you know, a human being will always look at something that may have been meant for, to protect them as negative. And therefore, that is one of the reasons, and sometimes because of insecurity, sometimes because of uh, their behavior, sometimes of students who can escape. That is what makes some of the schools put these uh, grills and everything. So it's not meant to be a prison, but attitude is what now makes the young people feel like it is a prison. To answer your question, life is excessively rigid. Imagine living life in the same place, everything taking place in the same place, where with stringent measures, living in the same cohort, you know, it's not good at all. Um. I'll just go back to my PowerPoint. All right. Um, as you can see from the clip, uh, Miss Indasi was simply brilliant. Her major point was that the living conditions in the school were unbearable. And what I'm going to argue is that nobody was willing to listen to uh, her point of view. And what she was saying is that without an outlet, um, the students were obliged to grab attention uh, through doing something uh, drastic, a strategy which the young people could see works in the political space. Um, so in both the panel and in the public reactions, there were moments in which her uh, observations 
uh, were not really taken that seriously. The reaction to her engagement fell along five main fallacies, which I will post here. Sorry. So the first one was personal derision. Uh, the second was uh, an appeal to a different era and a different economic class. The third was appeal to an appeal to technical expertise, of course, which she did not have. The fourth was the support for violence, which we have kind of seen a hint in the previous uh, uh, hashtag that I've just discussed, and also a denial that there's really a big problem. But before I get to discussing these fallacies, I would like to discuss the concept of political vernacular, which in turn would help us understand not just the fallacies, but what they actually do to the conversation about uh, violence in school. So I got the concept of political vernacular from an article by Keguro Masharia in the New uh, Inquiry, where he describes political vernaculars as, quote, the way in which Kenyans, uh, the way in which Kenyans use words and phrases that assemble something experienced as the political and gather different groups around something marked as political. In other words, a topic or experience marked as political comes with certain linguistics and uh, linguistic and discursive practices that are largely restrictive. The article by Keguro Masharia names these practices as dualisms, which form uh, something similar to Eke's famous concept of the two publics in Africa, where one relates to the moral and affective public in terms of community, while the other public is the colonial state. Masharia develops the schism between vernacular languages and the state official, official languages in order to identify the different dualisms between the spoken and what he calls the whispers. In his words, vernaculars, quote, name real issues, but they also manage how those issues are handled, end of quote. Anything that falls outside the realm of these vernaculars is spoken as whispers, and this is the recurring theme in Kenyan literature. For example, we see this in Yvonne Owar's work, where she talks of silence as a national language, or her first story, The Weight of Whispers. Or we see this in the humor of Wahome Mutahi, who was also nicknamed Whispers. Another trait of Kenyan political vernaculars is their closed cycle. Uh, and this is what uh, uh, Masharia explains. He says that a topic is named, lamented by the public, a commission of inquiry is set up, and then as the interest in the issue wanes, the issue is divided into what is bad and must go, and what is good and must stay. In this cycle, Kenyans are invited to democratically participate, while in reality they are being told to shut up. Masharia calls this practice anti-democracy and one that goes uh, that does not go beyond the imaginaries of the state. One common gesture that entrenches this practice of anti-democracy is the demand for solutions. Anything that sounds un uh, uncomfortably political is met with the question, what is your solution? As Masharia explains, the question on what our solutions are pretends to equalize every citizen and allow them to contribute to a collective project, but in actual fact it atomizes individuals and dismisses the value of knowledge, expertise, and experience. What is your solution is an announcement that one is not allowed to imagine or locate themselves outside the parameters of the state. The Kenya vernacular of education, therefore, presents society with an impossible choice to preserve the colonial system or to affirm the dignity of children. And these, it is these five fallacies which I have posted there, which I'll discuss, and I will show that children or young people lose every time when posited against the colonial school system. So in the first one, derision, this is a reference to the ad hominem attacks that are usually directed at young people. 
Uh, in the case of Miss Indasi in the clip, uh, being a young woman and articulate in English, it was almost predictable that Kenyans would mock her as indisciplined and spoiled. A number of comments from social media suggested that she was complaining about bland and constant meals of githeri when children from and githeri is sort of a simple meal of beans and maize uh, and it is usually associated with with the poverty and bad school meals and uh, she was blamed for complaining about bad meals when uh, children from poorer communities do not have uh, constant meals on the Facebook post where Larry Madowa shared the discussion, one comment said, I quote, funny enough, she ate Githeri and didn't die, unquote. While another one suggested that students who were used to eating delicacies at home found it difficult to adjust to the drudge of high school life. This better than nothing argument, which presents a choice between bad food and non at all denies the dignity of children even poor because even poor children deserve a decent meal on the second uh, fallacy on appeal to a different era and a different socioeconomic class the most sophisticated version of this uh, fallacy was the speaker's person was the was that children who are vocal about terrible living conditions in high school normally come from middle and upper Kenyan classes. The well-respected Professor Bitange Demo, a former permanent secretary and currently a professor at the University of Nairobi, sent a tweet during the discussion in which he suggested that the millennial generation was not conversant with the resources available. Even the panelists in the discussion also implied that the current youth are special because they have greater access than their parents did to global information and they are therefore less tolerant of violence than previous generations. However, this argument does not stand to historical evidence because even in colonial schools, Kenyans did not tolerate the violence from missionary school staff. In his famous article, education for subordination, Kilemi Muiria says that Africans were indignant about the epistemic and cultural violence they faced in school. And so the idea that uh, children resist violence because they are from upper class families does not hold ground. The third fallacy about technical expertise was very striking because there was a search for solutions in psychological diagnosis, curriculum revision, and in the implementation of government policies on fire safety. However, Ms. Indasi reminded the panel that the measures were not enough because they did not deal with the root problem. She impressively cited a report that stated that 49% of the fires in the Kenyan high schools were deliberate rather than accidental results of failing to meet safety standards. To the proposal uh, of, uh, of counseling as a remedy uh, for school fires, she responded with a complaint that I have had before in other circles, which is that Kenyan counselors sometimes do not listen to their patients and immediately offer remedies rather than listen to the patient. Ms. Indasi attributed this insensitivity to age difference between the counselors and the students and mistakenly used the word centuries for old people rather than the word decade old. And Kenyans used this very minor detail to make fun of her and dismiss her larger point, which was not in no way effect, affected by her error. So you'll see the social media responses to the conversation saying that, uh, why is she talking of centuries instead of decades? And then the fourth fallacy on the support of violence, that was perhaps the most disturbing but not surprising reaction of Kenyans, which was to insist that the lack of violence in the form of corporal punishment was the cause of student of the school problems. Some of the tweets read by Larry Madowa during the interviews uh, included comments such as, I quote, better be in prison for four years and free for life. And another comment, uh, I think this was on, on Twitter, 
uh, which said, I quote, I was beaten with hockey sticks and this is what made me who I am. At one point of the discussion, oh, sorry, at one point the discussion was accompanied by amusement when uh, Madowo read a tweet stating that the 1990s babies do not have these problems because they had been subjected, subjected to corporal punishment. Um, after which uh, Madowo laughingly referred to a common Kenyan saying that tulichapwa na tukatokea tu sawa meaning we were beaten but we turned out fine and then the last fallacy uh which is the defense of the school system all these reactions in the conversation both on social media and during the uh, in the panel discussion were geared towards saying that the problems facing young people in schools were too minor to warrant the drastic reactions that we see some Kenyans went further to say that there is no problem with the school system. One tweet which was read by Madowa during the discussion stated that, I quote, you cannot blame a system that has existed uh, for 15 years flawlessly, and quote, while another comment that was sent uh, on, on social media said, the school system works. So what I'm saying here is that we are looking at a Kenyan society that does not consider the abuse of inj or injuries of children a sign that something is wrong. Our children's voices are not enough to demand that adults pose and do something drastic about the education system. This reality is a form of what Lewis Gordon calls theodicy, where people's experiences uh, which contradict a system's claim to perfection in this case, uh, the experiences of our children are branded as problem people. The school system must be protected, maybe with a few modifications at the expense of our children. So I want to talk about the, the violence of language. From the treatment of Ms. Indasi, it is clear that one tactic by which the political vernacular entrenches state imaginaries is by denying individuals the social impact of their words. By social impact, I'm referring to the fact that when we speak, we are affirming ourselves as social beings and we are participating in democracy because it is through conversation that people seek solidarity with the others in pursuit of a larger truth beyond themselves. However, as we see from the from this uh, experience, the political vernacular denies youth the ability to propel a larger conversation beyond the literal meaning of what one says. And what happens when the public disagrees with what the youth says, the, the response is to drown the conversations in discussions of style and attitude. In the case of Miss Indasi, the response to her insight suggested that she lacked gratitude, that she had failed to understand that adults have the best, the students' best interests at heart, and that she was locked in an idealism with no sense of reality. Her words were not allowed to go beyond her person and be compelling enough for society to consider the state of the schools. When society comes up with excuses to make the words of young people irrelevant, then the young people have no choice but to communicate in tools uh, other than words. As Miss Indasi put it, the teachers, the teenagers have learned from the adults that, I quote, violence creates a channel where the public gets their grievances out and so the government has to act. However, adults uh, avoid conversations with the youth because to listen to the youth is to consider their words socially and practically impactful and it means that we adults must assume our social responsibility to to make demands of the education system in which our children are learning and it makes sense why the state displays such a visceral hatred towards uh, children um children are innocent in the sense that they have not mastered the political vernacular like adults have like miss indasi children are expressive and they have not learned the whispers of oppression that the adults have learned through painful experience 
A second reason why children are threatening to the state is because their innocence demands responsibility from adults, which ultimately requires parents to become political. Henry Giroux notes that this responsibility is central to democracy, stating that, I quote, democracy is linked to the well-being of youth while the status of how a society imagines demo uh, democracy and its future is contingent on how it views its responsibility towards future generations, unquote. But as we see from Masharia's essay, the role of the political vernaculars of education in Kenya is to deny access to the political. Describing Kenyan youths in adult terms avoids, affords the state the benefit of depoliticizing the adults by placing children outside the parental responsibility and setting them in confrontation with the state. It denies the state's responsibility of educating children and the parents' responsibility to demand that service from the state. And when we refuse to assume our responsibility as adults, we transfer it to our children. This reversal of roles was evident in the NTV conversation, which I just played, uh, it's re because it relied on Ms. Indasi to talk the reality about the school system and the flawed cultures of education, counseling, and violence. At one point, Madawa briefly explained, expected Ms. Indasi to answer the question that was beyond her expertise. When he read the tweet stating, quote, better be in prison for four years and free for life, unquote, Ms. Indasia disagreed and impulsively Madoa asked her why the school should not be a prison. Given that he quickly changed the subject, he seems to have instinctively realized that such a question required a political level of analysis that may step outside the boundary of, that was imposed by the political vernacular. So why are Kenyans so protective of such a violent school system that they are willing to use discursive practices to protect it? Uh, Kenyans are unable or unwilling to conceptually suspend the school system and consider it independently of its survival. This siege mentality is maintained by the fact that our ex in our extremely hierarchical society, school is the only avenue that promises social advancement to the majority of people. Although this promise is fulfilled for only 3% of the population, the ideal that schooling provides every child with an equal, equal chance of social mobility is maintained by the abusive system of examinations and by a rhetoric which equates academic performance to merit. To keep this imaginary intact, Kenyans are therefore forced to unquestionably, unquestionably accept the following. We accept that violence in school is responsible for opportunities which educated Kenyans have. The credit we give to violence conforms to the comforts the uh, colonial narrative of meritocracy and diminishes the role that our memory, our work, our communities and fate uh, play in our quote unquote success. The second belief we have is that traumatic injuries are harmless because they are not physically visible. And so we have a very traumatized society that is quick to erupt into violence and that often justifies violence. The third belief we have about uh, violence is that institutions are fundamentally good and when they harm people, it is the people and not the institution that should change. Ultimately, we have accepted a theodicy of institutions where it is more important to protect institutions than the people. Institutional worship is a form of idolatry because humanity becomes subordinate to the institutions which human beings create. Ultimately, the political vernacular of education forces Kenyans to prioritize the school over their own children. That is not to say that Kenyans do not care about their children. It is to say that all the contradictions of the school system will be denied by adults, and the inevitable result is that children will become the vent 
through which the contradictions are evacuated from society. Giroux captures this dynamic in, his, in this brilliant observation. I quote, youth is no longer the place where society reveals its dreams, but where it increasingly hides its nightmares, unquote. Similarly, Kenyan youth have become the place where Kenya increasingly hides its nightmares. Our political class is so committed to perpetuating the colonial vestiges, and we can no longer deny that this arrangement does not work for the majority of Kenyans. But rather than adults admitting this and doing, and doing the foreboding political work of rearranging this uh, society, we let our youth bear the brunt of our reluctance. Of course, this reality does not present itself as blatantly as I have described it. The cycle of, uh, of the political vernacular blunts the sharp edges of this brutality by momentarily allowing for an outpouring of outrage and grief, especially by the parents. Our outrage allows us to delude ourselves that something will finally be done to stop the violence, but it does not lead us to imagine a new way of doing education. But after the funeral rites are over, the battle for the control of the narrative in which uh, the schools are declared good and the children declared bad continues. We follow the sequence that is described by Keguro's essay as follows. I quote, identify an issue, call for investigations and firings, establish a commission, uh, commission a report, then file the report in the graveyard of reports. Even those who are aware of how this cycle works, even the most critical of it cannot imagine anything else, unquote. Ultimately, the stopping of school violence requires fundamental political work of, as Masharia notes, inventing a political vernacular that goes beyond the options which have been presented. This requires political action of pre, uh, replacing the current system and its philosophy of cruelty with a humane one where our children's lives are paramount. That political space needs to be created through words and through a political vernacular which renders the brutality suffered by our children unfathom unfathomable, unacceptable, and abominable. But as Keguro Masharia uh, encourages us, uh, such a political vernacular um, of freedom requires love. Love for our children should inspire to th us to think of freedom from our current imprisonment in the state schooling system and, uh, and uh, to imagine an education that goes beyond the school to nurturing humanity and freedom. Um, and I'll end my presentation there. Thank you, Prof. Okay, so we've got about 40 minutes for Q&A and comments. Um, so if you want to join in there, please raise your hand in the Zoom uh, system and I will call on you in order that I get them. I do see that we, we, we have a few Kenyans in the room. I can see that. Um, so I'm anticipating some feedback. Okay. Got one here. Um, I'm shy. I've just uh, enabled your videos. And so you have the floor to comment or question. You may have to switch over to panelists. Okay. Okay, so if you just unmute yourself and turn on your video if you wish. Okay. There you go, I can hear you now. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Andia. We were being polite and as guests coming all the way and waiting for the people who are in Florida to speak first, but thank you for <laughs> Um, 
And Wendia, thank you very much for your reflection. And I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm still thinking about the way you look at, you use um, uh, Keguro's concept of political vernaculars to help us unpack this. And as you were speaking, I was wondering, last year, the schools closed for uh, about a, you know, a, a significant period. I'm not sure if they closed, not quite for a full year, but for a significant period. And um, students were at home and having to learn in one way or the other from home. And I'm wondering if for you, this was an opportunity for people to reimagine, um, to do the work of reimagination that you were talking about. If you felt that um, that opportunity, even if it was in a very small way, uh, was something that people began to do, or maybe did it in a big way, I don't know what you would say about it. But thank you very much for a really um, thought-provoking uh, reflection. Do you want to take that one or do you want to take, we have another question or comment if you want to take more than one or do you want to go one at a time? Yeah, I'd like to take a few at a okay. time. Uh, I see one from Apollo Amoko. So Apollo, go ahead. Apollo, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to okay. remind myself to unmute myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your very provocative presentation, Wandia. Um, I have, uh, I guess, two not fully formed question. One is, I would like to hear your reflections on what at least my impression is, uh, is a widespread tendency of people who are themselves victims of horrific violence during their schooling to retrospectively justify it. Uh, in fact, I had a very bizarre encounter in one of my visits in Kenya where uh, a former schoolmate of mine, who to my knowledge was deeply aggrieved at how much we were being uh, physically violated through high school. His child misbehaved and he punched him in the head so hard and told me that he feels that he has succeeded when the child uh, sees stars. And he was completely dismissive when I told him, you have just described a concussion, a trauma to the brain. And he went to the extent of saying to me, I think the problem is you are Americanized as if uh, violence against children does not occur in America, or as if there's some kind of Kenyan uh, exemption to the science of brain trauma and concussions. So that's one sense that uh, at a naive level, I would have expected people who had been badly traumatized and injured to be uh, resistance to this rhetoric of violence. And the second question I had was, uh, the comment that was made to the young woman that she was idealistic and untethered to reality struck me as supremely ironic because it is the discourse of the adults around the Kenyan education system that seems routinely untethered from reality. So for instance, this lamentation that indiscipline is as a result of the banning of corporal punishment which is a banning in, a, in name only. It's, it has never been implemented. Or to give another example, the sort of indifference to the horrific and inhumane overcrowding in the schools by a sector that then celebrates the successes of free education when you have classrooms that have hundreds of 100 students in a room that was designed for maybe 30 or dormitories that have twice or thrice their capacity. So I don't know. Yeah, it just struck me uh, whether you have any comments about it's the adults in the room that are completely untethered to reality and almost, anyway, I'll stop there, sorry. Wandi, I'll let you take those two and then we've got two more in the queue. All right. Okay, uh, thank you, Mshai, for, for being awake and for your comment. Um, 
Yes, I I thought that the COVID pandemic was a good time to reimagine education. Uh, I've been talking a lot about having uh, artists be involved in doing more creative work, in rendering even science in artistic forms so that the children can, and the young adults can learn even science through the arts or through dramatization or music or that. I think the COVID pandemic would have been a very good time to allow the artists to do that kind of work. But um, I think, again, the political vernacular was about inequality and going back to school. And the reason why that vernacular persists is because the government is in the center of that vernacular, because everybody is now looking forward towards uh, the schools opening. You know, when is the date? What is going to happen? What are the COVID uh, um, re regulations that are going to be implemented by the school? And this is a frustration that I have with the way we discuss education, especially even as we are talking about CBC. What the media does is that they technologize the problem, as we see even in this conversation. They, they, they restrict the conversation to technical solu solutions, quote unquote, where um, the kinds of responses that are being expected are responses from the government. And so once the, the conversation is locked into the imaginaries of the state, as Keguro would put it, then there's no opportunity to think outside the box and think, is there another way we can do education? Another suggestion that I had had was that we could have had uh, traveling libraries, you know? And in fact, the constitution had envisioned that counties would be in charge of libraries. So if our devolution had been working, we would be having public libraries in every county, there could have been ways to distribute books for reading and the, the books could have been circulated because at least I felt that the thing kids needed most was just intellectual sti stimulation that comes from reading, but everybody was talking about exams and the syllabus and whether students will have finished the syllabus before exams. So the, the conversation was too controlled we couldn't talk about anything else. Um, so uh, thank you, Amoko, for the, for your comments. Oh, that story, the story of your friend. I, I, I still get shocked by these stories. Um, yes, but you know what, what he was telling you about your two American, you've been there. Even uh, Miss Indasi, when people were talking about on social media about her, because of the way she spoke English and the accent, her accent, people used that to say, oh, she's not a regular Kenyan. She doesn't know what is uh, the real Kenyan way of doing things. And then, of course, there was the idea that she's, she's spoiled. So, um, yeah, I think uh, Americanization has become an alibi for ignoring the real issue. Once you say, oh, people who don't like uh, violence against children are Americans or they, are, they don't know the realities of Kenya, then you lock the conversation. And then uh, you, uh, what happens is that you're forced to start uh, justifying yourself saying, no, you know, violence is violence or, you know, what you're saying that is there something special about the Kenyan head that is not, doesn't get a tra a trauma, a concussion when you use so much force. Um, so that's part of the vernacular. It's to to uh, to label any um, questioning of violence as something foreign to Kenyan society. Um, and yet, when you read, uh, for example, uh, Jaramogi's book, Not Yet Uhuru, even they resisted violence in the school system. They stood up to their uh, the, uh, the missionaries who were in charge of the schools they were in. So it's not true that that uh, desire for freedom is a foreign thing, but that's what the vernacular says, that if you resist violence, it's because you're, you're influenced by foreign ideas. And when you think of it even politically, it was a time if you oppose the government, you'd be called a dissident. These days, like today, I've been accused a lot of being paid by donors. So there's always that way of Kenyans deflecting issues by accusing the person who raises them as being influenced by foreign ideas. Um, 
And yes, it's ironical that uh, it's the parents, it's the adults who have a, 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 um, who have less a, a grasp on reality than our young people. Uh, there's an interview I did with Hilda Oburu. She wrote uh, her dissertation on um, masculinity, uh, school fires and violence in, in high schools, which she finished last year. And, uh, and I've interviewed her on Maisha Kazini, my YouTube channel. And one of the striking things about all the chapters is that it's the youth who have a hand on the reality. They are the ones who can see the contradictions of the parents. They can see the contradictions of society. Um, they are very aware of the violence of, of exams and of unemployment. They know what is waiting for them when they finish high school. And yet the people who insist that no, they must not think, they must just do what the teacher says, it's the parents. And so they find it very difficult to accept the realities of violence in the education system. And that goes beyond the parents to the institutions. The media won't report it. The government will say nothing about it. So it's, it's the children who, can, who speak and who see the truth. And that is a tragedy for politics because it means there are no adults in the room. There are no adults who are making political demands of 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 our leaders thank you okay next up eric if you can unmute yourself and turn on your video if you would like hi my name is eric uh, call me i am currently at the university of florida um taking a phd in music education and uh, I can relate actually to, by the way, that's a nice presentation and a very thought provoking as the rest of the people have said. And I can personally relate to everything that, I mean, everything that goes through the student's mind because I've been through every bit of it. The violence, the, the, the corporal punishments, the bad food and all that. So when you presented, uh, it kind of don't to me and 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 the, the, where I am right now, the, the way you're calling it Americanization, I, well, that one was one of the culture shocks that I experienced here when I talked to um, my friends and other people. What happens in a, the education system and the way child uh, children rights are protected in school and everywhere else is just amazing on another, on another level. So what happens in Kenya is. When you see adults talking uh, the way they talk or the way they speak when children kind of misbehave and they are not punished, I think there are people who have gone through the system and they kind of radicalized, they were kind of radicalized by the system of the punishments and all that so in such a way that if a child misbehaves right now and there's nothing that is done to the child, then to them, something is wrong because I can relate when I was in primary school and we made mistakes and when the teacher realized and never beat us, then we thought something was wrong with that teacher because we we're always expecting to be, expected to be beaten at all those, every time you make a mistake. So I think the conversation is coming to a point whereby, um, and, and this is a question, what do you think going forward because the corporal punishment is kind of illegal as we talk, although somehow teachers do it. Um, but I think it's a changing situation, don't you think so? Thank you. All right, and we'll take another question from Anthony. Go ahead, Anthony. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. thank you so much for presentation um, Anthony Gadillo. Anthony, can you try moving to a little slightly different location because you're breaking up the University of Florida, but currently I'm in Kenya, so I know you had to stay this late to give us uh, 
All right. Mine will just be a comment. Uh, I'm a product of 844, and I know most of us who can you hear me now? That's better, yes. Hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, that's better. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. You can hear me now? Okay. So, saying the study. Okay, thank you. I was saying, uh, okay, thank you. I'm, I'm a master's student, sustainable development. Okay, and we, I think we've lost Anthony's signal. So if there's anyone else that has a question, but in the meantime, uh, Wanda, go ahead and, and uh, deal with Eric's comments and questions. All right. Um, I, I just wanted to point out that uh, maybe where you are, Eric, the, the there might uh, be a better experience for children, but uh, we know that even in the schools in the inner cities and that are predominantly uh, attended by children of color also have this kind of problem, except that they have the police uh, 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 instead doing most of, of the violence. So there's a higher rate of children being even arrested for de for things that could be related to even just um, a psychological issues and schools don't have uh, a psychiatrist or a nurse to take care of of children in distress um, so actually this problem is a problem of the state that the state is trying to resolve its inability to guarantee a future for the youth by criminalizing the youth and that's why uh, Henry Giroux's work is, is so relevant uh, because the ideology with which uh, um, the heavy hand of the state is, is used to bear around, uh, uh, upon young people in the US is the same ideology that is used here. And in fact, a lot of the rhetoric, American rhetoric that is, is used in, uh, when it comes to education issues is imported here. And this has been a... a this has been a trend since the days of Du Bois, because um, in, in 1924, for example, we had the Phelps Stoke Commission, which was promoting the ideas of education, which were, which were being championed by Booker T. Washington. So there's a history of Kenya adopting the educational logic of the US. And, and um, I think it's the case even in this, in this a uh, scenario where we are seeing a lot of uh, a state uh, sort of violence being justified when it comes to students. Um, I think it was last year or last year, but it was last year, but one, uh, Betty DeVos's brother, Eric Prince, uh, he moved to Kenya. And I think two years ago, uh, the Basic Education Act was amended to include training against terrorism. So there are all these um, Americanisms. If we are to talk of Americanisms, those are the kinds of Americanisms we are seeing being imported into the Kenya education system. Um, and also, uh, one of the, the comments you are making is, is, it reminded me of the demonization of parents. Apart from this violence we we speak against children there's also a demonization of parents as we see even with the hashtag ifikie wazazi basically what we are seeing is an increasing use or uh, condemnation of parents for things that the children do and we are seeing this stereotypical a parent always being used as a model for why the government must intervene in homes. And it's a really silly model because people say, oh, children these days, the problem is they are, they are always on 24 hour internet. How many Kenyan children have internet? Very few, but that's the model that is used to justify the police being harsh on children or people saying that uh, the misbehaved children are from homes where it's the house girls that raise the children. How many Kenyan families can afford that? And yet the rhetoric uses that as the standard model for 
as the, uh, as the cause of all social problems. Um, is this changing? I'm, I'm currently not very hopeful that it is changing because like I said, the problem isn't even fighting against the violence. It's getting a language that allows us to discuss uh, violence as, against children as wrong. We don't have it. Like I said, if, if when we condemn, for example, especially when you see uh, extrajudicial killings, if you comment on it in a way that is not favorable to the police, you're bombarded with replies telling you, you know, why are you not understanding the police have work to do? Do you want uh, communities to be flooded with criminal gangs? You know, these people are dangerous. And it, in fact, the, the only time we were not bombarded with those tweets was uh, when in this recent case of the Kianjokoma boys who were who were killed by by the police that was the only time we did not uh, experience the harassment because i think this case was just too obvious that it was so unfair but uh, immediately there was a, a, a an extrajudicial killing the next day you get the the bombardment that you know these are dangerous people they they, they had to be shot by the police so the problem is, I'm not saying that we, we should not focus on the actual end to violence, but one of the things that makes the violence not stop is because we don't yet have an acceptable language to say that violence against children is unacceptable, it's immoral, it's anti-African, and it's predatory because we are killing our future. And, and it's very hard to have that conversation because of the vernacular that I have just talked about. Okay, I see Anthony's signal is back. So Anthony, we're gonna try again. Hopefully you have a better connection, um, but you can go ahead with your question or comments. And yes. yes. Thank you. I think my, my network is much better now. Yeah, so let me just be quick with my question. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Riwandia, for the presentation. I'm a sustainable development uh, student, and my question or comment is, what's your take on the new curriculum? Because I find that most parents currently are lamenting about it, and you're talking about the change in, in into the new system and how we are going to engage our, our children. On the new curriculum, the CBC. Thanks, Anthony. And and Rose Lugano is here with us now. So we'll take a, a second question from Wanlimu Rose. Uh, and uh, then I'll let Wandia answer both of those. Okay, that's very nice, Wandia. Nice to see you. We haven't seen each other for a long, long time. She was a year behind me at Penn State. We were together. So Good nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you. You haven't changed at all. <laughs> yeah. So my, my question was, uh, I'm just wondering, OK, the schools seem to be failing the children with the violence. And I was wondering, how was it during the time that the children had to stay at home and under the supervision of parents? What came out of that? Because was there? any reports of violence from the homes? Because I, from the cartoons I've been seeing, uh, it looks like things were happening there too. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you, Anthony, for your question. Uh, oh my, the new curriculum, I can talk for 10 hours about it. Maybe I can just say in relation to what I'm saying about uh, the vernacular, about violence against youth and the blame on the parents, is that CBC has imported that narrative. Uh, one of the things I, I completely disagree with is the idea of parental involvement because uh, it's importing the inequalities from the home into the school system. It's insisting that children's homework must be done by parents, and there's no consideration that uh, very few parents are educated and would be able to help children 
with the homework. It's also denying the diversity of of uh, of cultures and 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 it's usurping the role of culture in raising children. So basically, what it's saying is that the government knows better than parents and that any parenting style that falls outside what the government wants is is unacceptable. Um, so that has that that uh, uh, when when I challenge that idea, um, uh, people respond with the same rhetoric when it comes to school violence. They say, oh, you know, children are being raised by house girls, so now the parents have to be forced to raise their children. So it's the same rhetoric and logic of violence that um, parents don't know how to raise their children and it's the role of the government to tell parents what to do. And for me, the bigger uh, thing that I'm concerned about is the alienation of culture because culture is how we raise children through our values, our experiences, our identities, our extended families, all that is being uh, alienated for the government to tell uh, parents that the way you, you raise a child properly is by doing the homework we give you. So it's the same logic of, of violence, but there are so many other things that are wrong with that curriculum. But I mean, for the purposes of this conversation, I would say that uh, the, the 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 idea of parental involvement is still rooted in that idea of violence that children are are naturally misbehaving what they need is a kiboko or violence more than they need an education and the opportunity to be creative yeah oh so it's nice to see you I've again seen you. i've seen you by proxy through you know <laughs> i know your people <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you. It's good to see you. To um, see you. Yeah, during COVID, uh, it was not good because uh, there was a spike in teenage pregnancies. And when, again, the logic of violence against children, when the issue comes up, people start saying that girls are misbehaving. And you're talking about minors. Girls are misbehaving. Parents don't know what to do with their kids. In fact, that's what Magoha said that parents are not raising their children properly. And then you see once again, this bombardment of, of messages saying that the problem is parents, they don't know how to raise their children and that children are out of control. They are refusing to listen to their parents and they are leaving the house. But you know, it's possible that many of these, uh, these uh, pregnancies came from coercion, um, if not rape. And that was not within the radar of, of the public discussion. I mean, when it's the Minister of Education himself saying that the problem is parenting, I mean, that's such a poor analysis of a very complex problem. But that's, that's the violence which Keguro talks about. It's basically saying that uh, people, well, this violence alienates uh, the the role of knowledge and expertise. So we just resort to these narratives of bad parents and out of control kids, and we think we have really discussed the problem. And then, of course, um, there was also a rise in domestic violence, uh, yeah, which which is still being experienced today during the because of the stress of the pandemic and the fact that uh, people were not being able to leave their homes. So what we are seeing is, uh, um, I think what Keguro's work uh, makes us see is how difficult it is to discuss social problems in Kenya. There's just one narrative and we must stick to it. And there are so many ways of shutting us up and, and making us live in this fantasy world where there are no problems except children yeah thanks prof do we have i think we have time for another question is there anyone else in the room that wants to question or comment today going once Well, if if there's no no takers, then I'm 
happy to say thank you so much, Professor Wandi Joy, for joining us today. I know it's getting quite late on your side of the pond, so we'll let you go. Um, it was a pleasure having you. Uh, I, I think all of us learned a lot about the situation at the moment, so uh, we will hopefully see you soon. Thank you, Andia. I'll be in touch.